Are your employees stealing from you? Theft happens, and many practice owners don't think it's going to happen to them, but why wait to see if it does? My guest today helps practice owners reduce the chances of theft in their practice and has some advice for us. I'm Carl White, principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. The mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that usually what they want, but care is better when the provider owns the practice because that's when they're going to have the most freedom to make the clinical decisions they think are best. It's just different when somebody else owns the practice. Sometimes, usually, eventually, the agenda starts to creep in. It's more for the provider to think about. Let's just get rid of all of that and help them stay private to begin with. My guest today is Sarah Webb. Sarah founded Webb CFO, that's W-E-B-B, to provide accounting assistance and long-term financial planning guidance to licensed physicians and their private practice small businesses. Though Sarah and her team are happy to address the fundamental aspects of day-to-day -day accounting, such as cash flow management and budgeting, they take clients' financials a step further by adopting a strategic approach, which means leveraging numerical data for forecasting and planning and offering a broader management-oriented perspective. Love to hear that. And Sarah, thanks for taking some time. It's a busy time of year for you, gearing up to be, to come on Practice Care. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, whenever there's a topic about it's almost like intriguing and like watching, you know, a, a, a good or bad TV show, theft and things. Before we get into that, which we will, let me start where I start with every guest and just say, you know, tell us more about you. The bio I just read, I asked to be short, so it's going to leave some gaps. Help, get, help us get to know you better. So I'm a CPA, and when I was a baby accountant, I worked in public accounting <laughs> and I did tax returns, right? So I quickly learned that I don't love doing tax returns. And so I went and worked for a big pharmaceutical for a few years, about oh. 15 years. And there I kind of, I was exposed to physicians and, you know, worked with the sales team on what their plans were and how all of that worked. And I was traveling the world and I loved, I loved that, but I needed to be at home a little bit more. So I opened up my own accounting practice and I really looked around and was like, who needs help, right? I didn't want to be in the corporate world anymore. You know, when you're in the corporate world, you never worry about your paycheck, right? It, it just comes like it's a machine. And so I really saw a gap in small businesses. You know, maybe they have a bookkeeper or someone who runs payroll, but they might not have someone who really understands the whole accounting system and the cash related to that. And so worked for a few different small businesses and really saw a niche in physicians. Mm -hmm. um, physicians are great physicians, right? We go to them for exceptional care. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes in my special accounting or some other things related to running a business of the practice of medicine, not just, you know, the business of medicine, you know, there's some blind spots and that's how our team helps, helps practices on a day-to-day -day basis. Got it. Yeah. So we have a number of things in common. We are both corporate refugees. That's the term I was taught when I was getting out of the corporate world. Um, okay. Did time in corporate. And yeah, I mean, um, I've had physicians tell me, you know, one in particular I'm thinking of, he said, you know, Carl, in medical school, they never said that earning money, treating patients was bad and dirty and ugly. But man, oh man, you got the message. That's exactly what they thought, let alone say the word business or teach anything. So totally agree. That's why practice care exists. So let's get into a topic that would probably not even make a curriculum, a fantasy curriculum, if we could wave magic wand that would be introduced to a medical school, which is theft in a practice. It's a big deal. It's real. I have no idea what the statistics are, but they're probably bigger than anything I could find. And so there's a lot of ways to jump into it, but I thought I'd jump into it this way. What are some of the more common types of fraud you see when you, yeah. you know, with your clients, when you start working with them, whatever it might be? So there's big fraud, right? There are sometimes there's phishing schemes, you know, maybe your practice manager or someone who handles your accounting gets an email and they click on something, you know, mm -hmm. and then they get access to all of your data. And there's some really bad things that happen with yeah. that. And I've got a few sto war stories on that, mm -hmm. but it's also the small things, right? Um, just last week, one of my practices, I got a a bill from Amazon that someone had added HBO to their account. Like, I mean, it's only $16, but, you know, sometimes employees are- That's the test, I, right? That's, that's, yeah, that's like the that three cent the test. test on the credit card if they're watching. Yeah. Right. So, you know, kind yeah. of had to lock down things and change things. You know, sometimes we have time theft. If you have employees who are maybe if they're remotely able to clock in. Um, so there's, you know, 
big theft with like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then there's all these little bitty things that add up to a significant amount of money, mm -hmm. um, subscriptions, um, employees, if someone's in charge of payroll and then they pay themselves more, all those types of things are really considered theft. And, and accountants, we take a whole two college courses on ethics and theft. And, you know, that's, we're not trained investigators per se. We're not working for the IRS or the CIA or anything like that, but we see routine things and that leads us to ask questions, you know, yeah. what else is behind that? What's the, what's some like horror stories when it's employee-based theft, not like a, you know, a mistake, like clicking on the wrong link or anything like that, where, where it's just been really bad, you know, bad horror stories. Yeah. I mean, you definitely, so, so there's this thing called the fraud triangle. So the fraud triangle, you have to have three, you have to have pretty much all three things present and you're creating a situation where fraud could occur. Okay. One of them is opportunity, right? So do they have the opportunity? So if only one person does your accounting, if only one person does your payroll and there's no checks and balances in that, it's very easy to add people to payroll. It's easy to, maybe you're not giving them the right deduction for healthcare. You know, maybe they have a family plan, but you're only pay, you're only deducting the, the single person because you want to help a buddy out. There's that mm -hmm. opportunity without some separation of duties that those are the types of things that we see. Adding subscriptions, purchasing. Purchasing is a big, it's a big place where, you know, there's, if someone's in charge of purchasing and also receiving, we don't really know what they're purchasing. Like when I see an Amazon order, did it go to their house? Did it come mm. to the practice? You know, those are the types of things that you see. But as part of the fraud triangle, you have opportunity, rationalization, and pressure. So sometimes it's like, well, the practice owes me. I work so hard for them. It's not going to impact them. And so someone's rationalizing, Got I it. deserve this type of attitude. And sometimes, you know, employees, just like everyone else, are under intense pressure, financial pressure. Maybe they have a loved one that's sick or they're going through a divorce or something has changed in their financial situation that's created this pressure. Um, so those are some of the minor things you're like, oh, well, that, you know, how much toilet paper can one person steal? Yeah. Well, if they're constantly on your Amazon account and having things shipped to their house, I mean, it, it can add up pretty quickly. Wow. Um, but adding people to payroll, purchasing things for themselves. Those are the, those are the, those are the easier ones for employees to do because it's smaller amounts. For rationalization, I wonder, do you ever hear, well, I haven't gotten a raise in five years or whatever it is. So is that part of the, they owe me? Yeah. That's part of the, uh, they owe me feeling. Yes. Got it. Okay. So if you haven't, I guess, listeners, if you haven't given a, a raise in a number of years, you know, keep an eye out, I guess, you know, well, I mean, and maybe there's a reason for that. Sometimes when you're kind of looking at total compensation, I'm always, you know, there's a lot more that people value than just the paycheck. But, right. you know, having that conversation with your employee, at least annually, can, can, it can I don't want to say it can't, it's not preventing fraud. It's actually just a good business practice. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, you want to have health, healthy, well-balanced employees in your practice. You want, you don't want people who want to be there. Right. Right. And there was like a common theme that you were describing, which is if one person, so if one person, I guess what, oversees the process or oversees that function, you know, from end to end, that's right. Right. So you can just expand yeah. on that. So in accounting, we call it separation of duties. So you okay. never want one person to have control over everything. An example would be one team member maybe processes checks, but the physician or the practice manager is the person signing the check. We don't want the same person who preps the check to sign the check. Okay. Um, in payroll, whoever enters all the payroll data shouldn't be the same person to kind of push the button and release the final funds. Um, that just to have that check between people creates, you know, a boundary. But if they do want to commit fraud, it takes a lot more work because they have to agree to work together. Not that that can't happen, collusion, yep. right? But you're less likely. Like if someone came up to me and was like, hey, let's add a thousand dollars to our paycheck every week. I mean, most likely one person's not going to just jump right on board with yeah. that and, and say that we're going to do that. Yeah. And so if it's a really small practice, then then the other person could very well be the, the physician, the practitioner, right? I mean, it might have to be. Right. Um, we have some practices where 
you know, they'll use something like bill.com. If you can set it up, it's got a workflow approval so that the physician can, you know, cut checks or is the yeah. final approver. So that way you're not, um, you know, having the practice manager do everything. And I think there's great practice managers. I'm not saying everyone's out there yeah. stealing. It's actually a protection for them, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't, the physician or the whoever's signing the checks can't say, oh, well, they did this by themselves. So, you know, having that separation and that control of two people checking things um, protects both parties, actually. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, again, yeah, it's not, uh, I don't trust you. It's just, this is just a good practice. And, and I imagine if I asked you, you know, should you standardize this practice with, you know, lots of different processes, you'd probably say yes, right? I mean, just having more than one set of eyes. And like what, if you could, you know, lay out, like what are those functions? So you've, you've said here, you've said purchasing, you've said issuing checks, payroll, like what are the the good controls, I guess? Yeah. That, so know, those are the biggest ones because money is going out, Okay. right? So anytime money is going out, you likely need a control over that. Another one would be credit card um, statements or credit card expense reports, right? So someone turning in receipts for you if you have, you know, several company issued cards. Mm -hmm. um, those types, anything that has a second set of eyes. Um, I say reconciling your books. I, all of our clients get their books reconciled every single month because we do them. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes when we come on with a new client, maybe they haven't reconciled in three to four months. And that's, you know, someone else not looking at it. Um, our team, when we're looking at, you know, their expenses on a month to month basis, we can see, oh my gosh, you spent five times more at AT&T. Was that on purpose or, yeah. you know, those types of things. Um, if you're reconciling your books, your books, you'll see those types of things. Okay. So that's cash going out. What about cash coming in? Same, same discipline? It, most of the time we accept all the money that comes into us That's true. pretty, fr pretty <laughs> but freely. It, but it, needs I, to, it I, needs to go to its final resting place, right? It so. needs to go to its resting place. I try to say, make it easy to do business with you, um, especially you're getting paid by insurance companies. And so obviously there's a lot of back and forth with that. But I would say, you know, once a year, check with your clearinghouse. Mm -hmm. Are all the bank accounts on file? The ones, you know, potentially did your billing person set up a fake, another right. siphoning a, a piece? I'm, I have not seen a lot of that, but, you know, every quarter, or every six months doing some types of checks of, hey, this is all the money that we said we got in our EMR. How does that reconcile to our checking account? Where are mm -hmm. the differences? And sometimes it's just a timing difference. Right. Um, I, I haven't found any leaky money coming in. It's normally the money going out. Okay. Yeah, I know. I was thinking like all the money comes in, but does it go where it's supposed to go? You know, yeah, and that's part of a off. monthly, yeah, well, it's part of a monthly reconciliation process. Got it, um, okay. As part of closing your books. Some frauds that I have more recently seen is mm -hmm. changing bank accounts. So if a vendor calls you and says, hey, I need to update my banking, you know, that is a red flag. If a, a person on your mm. team, an employee, tries to send you new banking information through an email versus your process, that's a red flag. Um, specifically around payroll, we've instituted for all of our clients, we have to fill out a payroll form, but then we, we do this thing that's not common in 2023 is we pick up the phone and call people and we verify. Do they just you know, get stunned? They're, they're like, calling? I don't what? normally, why are you calling? I'm like, yeah. well, I want to verify your paycheck, but we've actually stopped several hundred thousand dollars of fraud by calling. Um, if I got some new banking information from a vendor, it just looked a little funny. And as part of my process, I always call. But what I did is I Googled the address and it wasn't a bank. It was a home in Michigan. Oh. And, you know, that was about $200,000 that the bank was, you know, we were trying to release a wire. Someone was, hey, we haven't been paid. We haven't been paid. And I just said, you know, let's just double check this address. Let's do a call. It went to voicemail, which we all send things to voicemail. But, mm -hmm. you know, there was just something, something about it. Um, and so picking up the phone and call and like verifying the information is how I've stopped at least three frauds. Wow. So if it, if it, if it looks slightly off, go with your gut, is go that... with your gut. I mean, no one's ever said, Hey, I'm going to pay you, but I wanted to verify this information. Like they're, they're grateful too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the credit card changes. So, okay. It expired in a new one different. Um, right but we need to double verify you. Yeah, that, that's not common. Okay. Especially when, the, I mean, in some practices, 
right? They were buying a, a large piece of equipment, right? We're not releasing $200,000 all the time, but, you know, you know, potentially put in some policies. If it's above this amount, we need to call and verify. You yeah. don't, you don't want it to bog down your everyday business. That's not what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. but we are trying to protect you because if you pay someone, a fraudulent person, you know, a few thousand dollars, you're never getting that back. I mean, it just, it's, it's very unlikely. It's gone. Yeah. It's, it's gone. gone. Yeah. Especially you're using your, you're using your bank versus your credit card. I mean, in credit cards, I think they have some really good protections, but bigger yeah. pieces of equipment, payments to employees, things like that are not happening through your credit card. Different story. Yeah. So we had a guest on well over a year ago, an attorney, and we talked about, it was a, it was a, a the topic had some similarities about, you know, I forget what it was, but uh, fraud, fraud in, in a practice. And so theft was part of it. Um, and, and one of the things that was said that really stuck with me is, you know, sometimes enough times, I'm not sure it's a majority of times, but enough times the person doing the stealing is the one you'd least suspect. Like, you know, the longest employee, been there for a long time. Um, why would so-and-so do that? And maybe it gets back to, you know, your, your triangle that you mentioned, but do you see that yeah. as well? I mean, does that ring true? Yeah, that does ring true, unfortunately. It, and it is about the rationalization, but if someone never goes on vacation and they're always there, that is a red flag to me. I'm talking like a six months to a year. You weren't sick. You weren't, mm -hmm. you didn't go do something fun. Mm -hmm. that that is a red flag to me one it's not healthy for our employees like they need that time away and that's yeah. a benefit we're providing them but if they are so worried about not being there they might be controlling something that you that you're not thinking about yeah you know um and sometimes i like to change like at the front desk if you have multiple front desk people and you're running multiple drawers you know switch those people or have them count each other's money Mm -hmm. But if your billing person is never ever um, taking a day off, or your practice manager, I, I would. It doesn't mean they're doing fraud, but there's something. There's something there. Yeah, something to look at. Yeah, and and I'm wondering, like, what, like, what, what is a good? How do you get started on controls? Because I could see, you know, like you said, maybe it's a certain level. If it's a check over five hundred bucks or whatever, it's got to be second set of eyes or something like, I could just see myself going, God, where do you start? Yeah. Oh God, you know? Well, I think first separating the very first control that I would do would separate the person who receives the bills from the check signer. From so paying them. from paying them, that okay. would be the number one thing that I would do. And then the second would be kind of looking at the payroll. Most of our practices use a payroll service. So it is a different person kind of you know, you've, you're using ADP or Blue Wave or some provider. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they have some checks and balances that they look at. Um, but I would definitely separate, okay, who's opening the mail, who's entering the checks, and then the signer needs to be a different person. Okay. And that could be, I mean, is that difficult to get started? Oh, um, no. I mean, especially if it's a really small practice, just make the physician the signer. Just take okay. that away from the practice manager um, I, I only run checks once a week, you know, Thursday is our day to run checks. Mm -hmm. So everything that needs to be paid for the next week, I need to stack up my desk at the end of the day. Yeah. I'll look at them overnight or on Friday morning, you review them, sign them. And then that person can even put them in the mail. Another control is to have another person put them in the mail, but I mean, that's getting like over controlled sure. for a small practice, but as long as the physician or someone else is signing the check, you've created a really good control. You've, right. you've eliminated the highest, the highest risk of where that leakage could happen. Got it. And I'm wondering, I could see myself sort of dwelling on this. So let's say I was doing it an uncontrolled way. And then I said, you know, we got to change this. Um, just think like, you know, telling my team, I mean, it, how do you say it without it coming across as, you know, suspicious or just, you want it to be positive. You want it to be accepted. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Hey, you know, I've, I'm taking more interest in our financial results and how we're planning. And one of the things I recently learned is I kind of need to separate these two things um, just to make sure that we're all balanced and well-controlled. So, you know, beginning next week, we're going to put in this process. Let's try it for 60 days and see how it works. Like it doesn't have to be this big monumental right. thing. And I would encourage physicians, you know, Make sure you're looking at your financials on a monthly basis. Are your accounts reconciled? You know, that mm -hmm. would be 
if that's something your practice manager does for you, um, which most a, a lot of practices are, that is what they're supporting. Um, mm -hmm. Sit down and go over it with them. Don't just let them send it, send it to you in an email. Spend an hour with them looking at the results and say, what's your process? Walk me through what you do here. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? If, if you don't have business time carved out to run your business, uh, you, that's worth changing. I mean, easy to say, I get it, busy days, but uh, my God, who else is going to look at it? You know, it's your, yeah. it's your business, it's your practice. Even if you spent one to two hours a month doing it, and that's more than you're doing now, you're going to learn a lot more about your practice. Yeah. You know what? So start there. There you go. Cool. Um, this has been great. I mean, this is, uh, it, it, it's, it's very eye opening. It sounds very approachable. It sounds very common or maybe not so common and it should be, I'm not sure. Um, and so to kind of bring us home, we're here about bite-sized advice, uh, all about that on practice care. A couple of questions I ask every guest. First one is any question you think I should have asked you, but I just didn't think to ask you. I think if you discover fraud, like what do you do? Yeah. Right? Okay. So if you discover fraud and we're talking big fraud, like several hundred thousand, maybe you've paid the wrong vendor. You need to be getting on the call. You need to be calling a an attorney really mm -hmm. quickly okay. um, because that vendor is going to ask you where that money is and you're going to have to say, I paid a fraudster by mm -hmm. accident. Um, and so you need legal representation. If you, if it's the type, if it's payroll fraud or, you know, the, the HBO getting added, right? right. Like, Follow your, follow your employee manual. I mean, if it's, if someone has added money to payroll for themselves or others, that's an immediate dismissal in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe not adding HBO to the Amazon account, but you know, I would definitely write that up and document it. Um, and potentially with the payroll fraud, that might be um, something you contact with an attorney. Um, but contacting an attorney, contacting your insurance company, do you have business? I was just going to you know, ask you. Insurance yeah. or cyber insurance. Um, I've seen some of those policies pay out. I think physicians do definitely need cyber insurance with all the data, you know, not just financial data that you have, but also um, the patient data. But that I would, I would think about, it's almost like a crisis response plan instead of like the communication piece of it. You know, what is, yeah. what would, what do we do? Who are the professionals that we call if we discover something? Yeah. It's fine. You know, as you were saying, the HBO, you know, maybe not termination. I was thinking maybe it ought to be, I mean, it's zero tolerance. It's equal, you know, then you, you, you still have to monitor everything, but you don't have to worry, boy, was that a big charge? And it's a serious, is it terminating? I just, you know, I mean, I was thinking about it as if I was an employee and I, and I saw somebody else was allowed to, you know, steal a little bit once, but nothing bad. I'd be like, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I was finding it's some money out of my pocket, I, you know? So, yeah. Well, and some of those things, especially online services and subscriptions, you may have accidentally clicked a button, right? So for the first so you part is finding it. Yes. Yeah. You have to investigate, um, you know, what really happened because, and especially in those types of situations, they could have accidentally signed up for something when they were ordering something, you know, I would definitely investigate that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm in accounting. We're trusted with people's data. We have no tolerance. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then I'd say, you know, so why are you checking out HBO during the workday? But, you know, separate. Let's have a talk about that one. <laughs> now that you didn't steal it. Right. <laughs> or I can't prove that you didn't. You didn't. Well, that's stealing time. I feel like I feel like you know? employers are very lenient on stealing time. Mm -hmm. So when an employee doesn't clock in at seven and they're there at seven ten, but they go and adjust their time. Oh, I was in here, but I didn't clock in. I feel like that is, that is where I would encourage practice managers and physicians to be more firm, not necessarily firing people, but like you said, like being firm from the very beginning and not tolerating things. Yeah. And so is the firmness just to follow up on that is the firmness. No, no, take 10 minutes off. I think you were yeah. here. You know? Yeah. I mean, not not being rude, just being truthful. You weren't here, so yeah. this is the we're this is when you've logged in. We're not adjusting it to your schedule if you were ten minutes late. Yeah, I mean, if if the roles are reversed, wouldn't you be a little irked? I think you would. Yeah. So just yeah. do what you said. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. And then the other wrap up question I, I have for every guest is: so we've caught a listener's attention, hopefully a lot of them, and they're thinking, you know, we we need to get better on this. Um, and they get enthusiastic. Sometimes though, people, you know, they get enthusiastic about something they haven't done before, but they get stuck at the starting line. They just, where do I start? There's so much to do. 
where could they start? Get, get them, nudge them off the starting line. Yeah. So an easy thing to do is just check, check all your recurring monthly expenses. So how to do that? You can either go to your P&L and look at, you know, what you're spending by category, mm -hmm. or you can go, you can pull a summary by vendor and see what you're spending each month and see, oh, did that change, you know, drastically? Did something mm -hmm. go down? I think you'd also be surprised on how many recurring expenses you have. Um, and I, I would even challenge you to eliminate a few, not from a fraud perspective, but right. just a waste, a waste perspective, yeah. you know, eliminating that. Okay. That's an easy starting point. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't intend this to be kind of a, a plug in any way, but it just seems like if you, it, this should be watched every month, right? It just, yeah. the money coming in and out should be watched and it should, it should know where it's going. You, somebody should know where it's going. And so whether you do it internally or you bring in somebody outside, like what you guys do, yeah. it should be watched. Um, yeah. because the, 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 it just seems more costly if you don't, you know, like whatever you're going to pay somebody to watch it regularly, it just seems like you're going to at some point have avoided something more costly. Yes. You and, know? and releasing funds or having duplicate payments to people for whatever, for a lack of control is, is more expensive, um, and time consuming and worrisome than, you know, having it set up correctly at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it feels like an insurance policy, right? We all buy insurance, yeah. hoping to God we never use it at all, but it's there if you need it. And so yeah. um, just, just lower the, lower the risk, I guess. Cool. Well, Sarah, thank you for coming on Practice Care and for, for bringing this issue to light, giving us some good practical tips. Nobody wants to be stolen from, that's for sure. And what has reopened my eyes is, gosh darn it, how many ways there are to steal from somebody. So it just takes a lot of watching and who's got time? I mean, you have to have time, but you need to carve it out somehow. So thank you for coming on and opening eyes again. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so you gave us some contact information that's going to go into the show notes for this episode. So anybody who wants to contact Sarah, that's another way to do so. A couple of quick points before wrapping up. First, if you're someone like Sarah, I, who serves private practice owners, or if you're a private practice owner yourself, either way, you've got experience on the business side of, of private practice that you think other private practice owners would benefit from, please, we want you to come on Practice Care and tell the world about it. In the show notes for Sarah's episode and every episode, there's a link, a couple of clicks, really simple. Tell us what's on your mind so we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, we do a new episode every week. And the easiest and best way to stay up to date is to subscribe to Practice Care. We're on Apple, we're on Spotify, we're on Google, we're on Amazon, we're on YouTube, just about every platform and player. Subscribe so that when new episodes drop like one did today, uh, you'll, you'll be notified. Thanks very much. And until next time.